So life really takes different routes sometimes, right? And very unexpected ones. So if you or anybody else ask me what I was going to be when I was young, I would probably answer a fashion designer. And the reason is that I learned how to use a needle when I was five, and I was frantically making clothes for my dolls, and then later on for my younger sister, and for the rest of the family when I got a little bit older. But then I also loved math, and putting these two together, it's not always the easiest thing to do, but I would say that math at the end won. So I started my... Um, technical education uh, in Croatia, so I'm um, not uh, Swedish. And um, I suppose that I always expected that I would be living close to Adriatic Sea in a warm country. But then a few years back, I found myself, one in the morning, driving a car uh, to Elfhe, so part of uh, Stockholm, with my husband-to-be. And again, it was one in the morning, it was very, very cold, and um, we were driving to a very big parking lot uh, because we were supposed to do some experiments with robots. So two of us on the front seat and on the back seat, buckled up, we had two robots. I was sitting there and thinking, oh, not honey, but um, I told him like, oh, I think that this is like as close as we come to having a family. And, you know, he looked at me and said, wow, geek. And, yeah, but I think that he loved it, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. So today I'm going to talk about sensing and perception. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what sensing and perception are and uh, why sometimes we take things for given uh, when um, we think about sensing and perception in humans and why perception is so difficult when we, when we try to develop artificial uh, systems such as robots. So humans um, make contact with the world uh, by using five different senses. So sensing is anything that comes in uh, or information that is picked up by one of those five senses. Perception is the interpretation of what is sensed. Now, this is very, very important, because the title of my talk is that sensing is easy, but perception is very, very hard. Three of the areas that I'm going to talk about today, or at least touch upon, uh, are biological vision, so vision not only in humans, but vision in general in animals. Uh, I'm going to talk about computer vision, so how do we make machines to see and how cameras as uh, a, a, a sensor for computer vision is used in some robotic applications. Now, when we talk about biological vision, so um, biological vision had millions of years to develop. And it has developed for the purpose of survival and reproduction. We have two eyes and we use them frequently. We are very good in recognizing each other's, even if, or, um, well, recognizing, spe recognizing people, even in quite different situations and with uh, different uh, clothes, facial features, and so on. We are pretty bad in interpreting and uh, remembering barcodes. And our vision is not perfect. We are easily fooled by different types of optical illusions. So in this case here, um, lines do not appear, appear parallel, even if they are. And we also sometimes um, 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 actually experience uh, motion in completely still images. Now, let me ask you a simple question. Now, this is not a tricky question. How many objects do you see, or how many items do you see in this image? We just need to count them. How many are there? Eight, okay. Very, very easy. Uh, how many Cokes or Coke, Coke cans do you see here? Five, good. So how many of you have actually realized while counting them that all of the cans were actually completely different? They were. But really, you don't 
you, d you didn't notice that this was not important to you. You were just looking for something that was red, small, maybe on a table and things like that. Now, let's say that we would like to help a robot or that we would like to develop a robot that moves around in your house and does exactly that, detects one of those eight objects. So it needs some sensing and it's usually equipped with a camera. And uh, this is a line of sight of the camera, so it basically just moves the camera in the same way as you move your neck and your eyes and it searches for an object. And every time when it finds an object, it puts it in a map. So it basically memorizes where it has detected a specific object. Why would it do that? Well, if you then later on send it to bring you a Coke can or to bring you a package of rice or something like that, it can remember where it saw it last. Now, pretty easy, right? Again, going back to the image, you said eight objects, and it was pretty easy uh, to, to answer that question. And I would like to ask you the same question again. How many objects do you see here? So what I'm showing you now is what the robot senses. Now, this is the image or the information that the robot gets from the camera. So it doesn't get an image like that. It gets this, it senses this, but we expect it to perceive this. So we would like the robot to actually answer the question of seeing eight objects in this thing here. So what's this? It looks really, really strange, like just some black and white dots, right? It's this. Image is nothing else but a big matrix of numbers, right? So I just magnify the part of it. So every color corresponds to a number. And the robot needs to make a decision or it needs to identify what's in the image by somehow dealing with these numbers. Now, how can we help a robot to do that? Well, if a Coke can is actually nothing else but just, a, just kind of like a matrix of numbers, we can cut it out from the image and we can call it T and then we have the whole image here. So this is just the numbers representing this image. We can call it I. And the easiest thing, of course, to do is just to go through the image, move this small window, right, through the whole image, moving it by one position and just estimate the difference. So very simple thing, right? We just use a minus sign. And what do we say? Well, we say that this uh, sum is minimum. So we just move the window in every single position. We estimate the sum. And this is what we get at the end. At the exactly same place where the Coke can was actually cut out, this difference between numbers is going to be equal to zero. So if robot does that, it will be able to find a Coke at exactly the same position where it is. However, size matters. Now, if we fool a robot a little bit and give it just a little bit bigger image of the Coke can, right? So this is what I did. I just magnified it and numbers changed a little bit. They changed their place. What happens when I do exactly the same kind of computation? the surface that shows the sums or differences is going to be completely different. Now, the minimum that I was looking for is not going to be zero anymore, and it's not going to be, in this case, at exactly the same place where I expect it to be. So here, or, well, I would expect it to be here. It's going to be somewhere else. So I am detecting, or the most likely position of the Coke can is somewhere here. Now, this is difficult, right? Um, it seemed very um, easy for a human, but how do I develop good representations for objects such as a Coke can? Why is this difficult? Well, it's difficult because I gave you an example. Coke cans comes or come in very different, um, um, uh, in different countries. You can have like different commercials and so on on them. They can be rotated in any, um, um, uh, in any angle in the uh, refrigerator on, on the table, and that can be of any size. That would potentially mean that regarding the computation that I have shown you previously, we would need to take care or have a small patch representing that object for every single angle, for every single depth, for every single type of a Coke can. And the, when the robot moves around and searches for that Coke can, it would need to compare every single image position with all possible examples of that Coke can. So that would take ages to do. 
So rather than waiting three hours in the living room for a robot to bring you a Coke can, you would just go up and bring it yourself, of course. Now let us look into a little bit different problem. What is it you actually see in this image? What is that pops up first? Can you see an object here? There is a dog, right? There is a kind of like a Dalmatian-like dog. So at least those that have seen a Dalmatian before can answer um, uh, that question. So you probably see something like this, right? So you have a very easy time, to some extent, segmenting the object from a very difficult, complex background without actually having any notion of the borders of the, uh, of the dog. So what is it we can do today, and how can we help robots to actually detect uh, uh, objects or segment them from the background? Well, state of the art, this is the newest work from our lab. We can actually do this pretty well. So we're just trying to find the border of the object. So the camera or the robot, again, moves its head and is just trying to segment or find the boundary of each of the objects. Now, this is, um, um, I would say, um, it has taken some time for us to do. It has taken several years to come to this point. But the robot can now do it very well. Now, the robot doesn't really know what it looks at. It can only segment the object from the background. Now, how can the robot say whether this is a, uh, let's say, a zebra or a duck? Very difficult. Now, what are, the, uh, what are the things and what are the methodologies that can help robot to do this kind, of a, uh, this kind of reasoning? Well, one thing that the robot can do, it can just uh, open any browser, right, and just try to dog and look for images of dogs and try to generate examples of how dogs usually look like. Now, compared to humans or category of humans, dogs come in, well, different shapes, different colors, different sizes. Well, most of them have four legs, but the relationship between the size or the length of the legs and the body may vary. Dogs can sometimes look like cats. And for some reason, a human has a very easy time distinguishing between these two. This is a cat. And that's a dog. In this case, too, is this a dog or is this a toy? Again, a very easy thing for a human to do, right? Now, making decisions or having robot perceiving the environment around them just based on images is um, difficult. So somehow, we need to equip the robots with the ability to not use just the local information in the image, but use or see the image as a whole. What am I trying to say here? Well, in order to understand what objects are and what they can be used for, maybe we also need to see or try to find what a human in that image is doing with that particular object. Now, in this particular case, it is very difficult uh, to say. Uh, well, it's very easy to say that this is still a frying pan, right? Um, but it's a, um, um, still an object that has two functions. You can uh, fry your eggs, but you can also play tennis. Now, um, current research in robotics is very much interested into looking and understanding the whole context of images and looking at the relationships between objects that are detected and between what is being done with those objects, not only in a single image, but in video sequences. Now, just to show you uh, one movie here, um, what we are doing is that we are trying to understand how human moves uh, its hand in interaction with different types of objects, so how a ball or a tool is manipulated by the human hand. So uh, we can call this sensing, so we can sense the color of the human hand, and this is what you see here. It's segmented from the, from the background very well. And this is the perception. This is what the uh, robot thinks the human does with his or her hand. Now, this is very important information. Why is this very important? Because it can help the robot to understand how it can use a similar or the same object. But it goes well beyond that, because it also helps us to understand which degrees of freedom uh, of, the, of the hand humans usually use when they interact with everyday objects. And this is very valuable because it can help us 
to develop next generation of intelligent hand prosthesis for people that are in need of those. Now, this is actually the end or the last movie that I would like you to show because there is another way of helping robots to understand the environment around them. And um, uh, that other way is actually through natural communication with humans. So in the same way as we teach our kids what to do and what not to do or how to do something or how to, for example, write, how to drink, how to use a knife and a, and a, uh, uh, and a fork, we can also teach our kids and explain them, well, that's a door, you can open it, you can close it and so on. So in this particular example, now this was like three or four years back, robot moves around it, makes, uh, try, it tries to understand what a room is and where there is a door in a room. So the robot has a, uh, it uses a laser for that, not vision. So there is a, a laser sensor here. So what the robot does, it moves around and it tries to perceive a door. So it tries to find something that is approximately 70 centimeters uh, wide and uh, opened. So upon making a hypothesis or sensing potentially a door, it just tries to ask a human for a confirmation. And if the human says yes, the robot will be able then to uh, label that part of uh, its map as a door. Now, for the future, uh, and I strongly believe so, we will be communicating with robots, but natural communication is very difficult to do. Now, this is just one of examples why it is difficult. So I hope I can get... I think that I will... I'm sorry, I need to start it again because... Is there a door there? Is there a door no. there? No. 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 Robot, no. Robot, no. 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 Robot, no. There's no fucking door here. <laughs> Okay, thank you for helping me. <laughs> okay. So, sensing is easy, perception is hard. And I would say that communication is still a long way to go. So, I just wanted to thank my collaborators, PhD students and uh, postdocs. So, thank you.